Supervisors. Um, our first item is actually the Board of Super, is item number 62, which is the Board of Supervisors shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the County of Santa Cruz Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 5, to convene and carry out a regularly scheduled meeting as outlined in the Zone 5 agenda, included as the Zone 5, December 12, 2017 agenda packet. And now, uh, wearing my uh, flood control and water conservation district hat, I would welcome you to the Zone 5 uh, meeting of uh, December 12th. Could we have a roll call? Director Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Harlan? Here. Christensen? Chair Leopold? Here. Um, are there any late additions or corrections to the agenda? None. Uh, then uh, we will move on to the regular agenda, which is oral communications. This is the time to address the Zone 5 uh, Flood Control and Water Conservation District Board about an issue that is within our purview. You'll get three minutes. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Becky Steinbruner. I'm a resident of the Mid-County Groundwater Basin. And um, I am interested in water issues. And I um, would like to ask this board to consider inviting Dr. Helen Dalkey to come speak to the county about her work with the University of California at Davis regarding using stormwater, flood water supplies to actually do uh, very effective groundwater recharge projects. I know there are a couple of projects, uh, one underway in the Pajaro Valley on the Thomas and Kelly farm. And I know that um, the county in partnership with Soquel Creek are, is looking for other sites uh, within the Mid-County Basin, but I think that our county um, would be well served to have this professional come. We do have an excellent source of information with Dr. Andy Fisher at UCSC, but I think that having Dr. Dalkey come <coughs> and provide additional um, information would serve our county well. And I'd like to ask your board to invite her to come. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other oral communications? Seeing none, uh, uh, Director Harlan. Oh, all oh, right. Yeah. Thank you. I have a couple. At the last meeting, I asked for some more information about uh, the system and the maps and so forth, which I've received. Map of the drainage ditches and the drainage pipes and so forth. And our situation in Capitola is that um, we uh, need to uh, meet in the next six months or so and go over the maps because this map shows some of the drains that we think are yours, and then we have a map that we think some are ours, and then some are we think are some are yours. So we need to do some <coughs> negotiating and just get it straightened out where the lines are and who they belong to and who's going to take care of them. And along with that, we need to come up with a funding source of how to maintain them. So that's a big, big problem that we need to discuss in the next year, I think. And my other request is that in the next meeting we have, in the next quarterly report, we have some more details in the... Um, in the reports about our expenditures, that a little, just a little description of, of uh, maintenance and operation and uh, some of these programs are where they are, what specifically, and we, I know we have a little bit more information that was very valuable this year, but a little more specificity. Where were they in Capitola or where, Soquel or you know, exactly where, kind of where were they or maybe pinpointed on a map, that would be helpful. So those are my requests, just to have a little more information so that I can explain it to people uh, how we're spending our little money that we have, and then to begin to think about how we can raise more money so that we can maintain this, this infrastructure that we have. We've sort of been ignoring it for many years, and, and now um, I'd like us to look at it, decide um, who, who owns what, and then we can figure out how we're gonna pay for that maintenance and cleaning and so forth for the future. Thank you. Okay, now I'll, uh, uh, Director Christensen has something. Oh, I just wanna uh, support uh, uh, Mayor Harlan on that that whole issue herself because I really agree that I think Capitola is acutely sen sensitive to the failure to maintain storm drains and st our stormwater system and it really had catastrophic consequences during one of the storm years in Capitola a few years back. But in regards to paying for it, uh, I just wanted to alert uh, 
staff that we, uh, that Senator Hertzberger, who is the chairman of the S uh, Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Water, is introducing a new bill to rectify what uh, was a result of a lawsuit back in 2002 to permit uh, districts to impose a stormwater management fee more easily without the, it being a tax and uh, it'd be a possible way that if we did have yeah. a stormwater system, we could actually start to raise some money perhaps to, to start addressing these, uh, some of the issues that, we've, that we have in this county on drainage. So I have, I have that here, for, I'll just give it to you. Yeah, I could say that this is a statewide issue that there's a lot of drainage districts that are having the same problem and trying to raise capital for these projects. Um, I, I can go up and down the state and name a number of counties. Um, we do have SB 231. We're waiting for the first county to take initiative on that and implement it. And that's where you take your drainage money or drainage flows and reuse those, that drainage somewhere else, like, like uh, groundwater recharge or use it for domestic water uses, things like that. So we are waiting for that. We, we have not taken that leap yet, but that is something that's being discussed at a statewide level. So SB 231 has been passed or? Yes. Uh, yes. But okay, all right. Senator Hertzberg expected that it would, uh, since it, the previous uh, fee collection was stopped in 2002, that lawsuits would, it would start to be challenged initially. And it, so people are kind of waiting, that, that, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, it redefines what stormwater is, whether or not you can put it in with domestic water use or sanitary sewer. And so that's, that's how it's been defined. It's just that we're not sure how to implement it at this point. Okay at a statewide level, so. Great. Yeah, I'd like to further, I was just at the uh, California uh, Association of Water Agencies last, just a couple weeks ago, and they're, they have a, a groundwater committee and they're deadlocked on whether stormwater is a benefit, you know, capturing stormwater is a beneficial use and it's, they have not been able to resolve that for about eight or, ever since 2002, eight, over eight years. Wow. It, yep. Yeah, you know, it's just a whole bunch of water agencies can't even agree. So, but it is still worth watching, watching for to see. Uh, it would be really helpful to get that. Uh, Maybe a future report if there's any action that you see uh, statewide. Yep. Uh, I would also uh, like to just ask for an item on our next Zone 5 agenda uh, to review our fees, our drainage fees on accessory dwelling units. The Board of Supervisors has had a lot of d discussion about reducing fees um, and there was a, uh, there's a fee charge for drainage. They still require to do the drainage, but uh, if we can reduce uh, fees, that is shown to be successful in helping build accessory dwelling units. So if we could have, a, if we could have an item about that so we can discuss it at our next meeting. So well, that closes oral communications and next we'll move on to item two, which is approval of the zone five minutes. Motion by Caput, seconded by Coonerty. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All, uh, any opposed, motion carries unanimously. Uh, next we'll move on to item three, which is as the board of directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood, and Con Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5, accept and file report on the first quarter 2017-18 Zone 5 expansion construction revenue as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. Good afternoon, Mr. Presley. Okay, so good afternoon. John Presley, your district engineer for Zone 5. Um, we're asking your board to accept and file this report on the first quarterly report for the 2017-2018 Zone 5 expansion construction revenue. We brought in about $49,578.15. We estimate we're gonna have about 197,000 at the end of the next year. Okay. Are there questions from members of the Zone 5 board? Are there comments from anybody in the public? Then I will bring it back to the board for action. Motion by Coonerty, seconded by McPherson. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We move on to item four, which is accept and file report on the fourth quarter 2016-17 Zone 5 expansion construction revenue as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. Okay, we're asking your board, Zone 5 board, to accept and file this report on the fourth quarterly report for last year, 2016-2017, Zone 5 construction revenue. Um, 
The current revenues for four quarters are $143,621.31, and uh, our projection is 188,617. We're a little bit below that. What we found out is we found another 26 that fiscal is now looking at would be added into the 143,000, and it brings up to about 169 for the year. So 169, 621, 31 is what we have in our budget for the end of the year. Okay, so there are some changes there. Any questions? Uh, Director question. Christensen. Well, I was just, I just noticed that the total last year was significantly higher. I was just wondering. Um, it all depends on development. Development. And, and yeah, and um, we have good years and bad years when it comes. And large, obviously large projects bring in a little more um, uh, um, drainage money for, for the zone five. So does that, do you have a prioritization of projects to do based on that? Yeah, most of this goes to maintenance purposes. So mm -hmm. yeah, so um, we'll we'll give you a report back on that as okay. as you requested. So, all right, thanks. Um, Some projects, but mostly supervisor Caput. Oh, kind of does jump off the page. Uh, Capitola, what? Oh, okay, that's Capitola, fourteen thousand. That's not, you know, that's not much at all. That was for last year. A few years back when they had the uh, mobile homes uh, flooded, was that, then it was significantly higher? Um, you know, a few years back, upstream of that, where they had the, the break in the pipe, we actually put about a million dollars into um, some flood control uh, pipe pipes up there in right. Capitola. Um, this, I think the city of Capitola was responsible for that drainage pipe that failed in Capitola. So that was, we don't, we don't believe it was our, under our jurisdiction at that point. Okay. That's, that's all been settled by the way, so. Yeah. Okay. This is an opportunity for members of the public if you have anything that you want to add about the 2016-2017 revenue. Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to our board for action. Move approval. Motion by community. Second. Seconded by Harlan, all right. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion carries unanimously. Our last item on the board is approve the 2018 schedule of zone five meetings as recommended by the district engineer. I can't say much more now. We have four um, dates identified for you in your board letter and we're asking you to, uh, to conceptually approve those dates. Are there any questions? Yes. Director Christensen. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, would uh, the uh, emergency, I guess, how does that, how does that work, calling of a, an additional meeting? Um, we would send out a, um, an email or, or call you as board members and ask for an, an emergency meeting if we, if we chose to do that. We can, we can take that request from any, any board member here. Okay. I'm not, I'm not anticipating anything, but I just was wondering what the mechanism is, and you would just put it into another uh, County Board of Supervisors agenda? Yes. Okay. Uh, now I'll see if there's any member of the public who wants to speak about the calendar of meetings. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the, 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 to the Zone 5 Board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Motion by friend. Second. Second. Seconded by Coonerty. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you uh, for the work and good to see our other directors. Thank you. <coughs> now, Capitola. <laughs> uh, now we will uh, move back to the uh, regular agenda of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Item number 63 which is a public hearing to consider proposed changes to the unified fee schedule and adoption of a resolution confirming the fee changes as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. There's a resolution about the unified fee schedule in exhibit A and B. And there's Ms. Daniels, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, members of the board. I'm Trish Daniels from the County Administrative Office. Twice each year in June and December, your board considers, uh, adopts amendments related to the unified fee schedule. On November 7th, 2017, your board set a public hearing for today for the latest proposed amendments. 
Um, as the board did defer the amendments to the affordable housing ordinance earlier this morning, the proposed fee changes related to that program will not be considered as part of today's public hearing, with the exception of items related to the accessory dwelling units that your board previously considered. So the first 500 feet of ADUs will be exempted and additional square footage will be charged at $2 above that. Uh, park has fee changes related to the swim center as well as, as, as administrative language changes. Uh, probation is eliminating fees related to juvenile hall placement, work follow, and adult drug testing. The sheriff's department has proposed changes um, including language clarifying um, forensic evidence analysis for outside agencies as well as a proposed fee structure for the alcohol nuisance abatement ordinance. And while the affordable housing fees are not being considered, the planning department does have fees related to the recordation and expungement that were presented as additional materials to your board, as, as well as hosted rental permit fees. Um, public works has language changes related to ADUs in conjunction with the planning department. Representatives from those departments are here to answer any of your questions, and it's recommended that your board open the public hearing for comment. Upon closure of the public hearing, adopt the resolution revising the unified fee schedule. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will see if there's a board member questions before we open the public hearing. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Just a point of clarification, although I think I know the answer. The staff report refers to an annual renewal permit on the hosted rentals. I believe that's supposed to be an every five-year renewal. Isn't that correct? Um, there should be staff here from planning to answer that. Kathy Malloy, Prevasage Planning Director. That will depend on the version of the hosted rental ordinance that the board ultimately decides to adopt on January 23rd. You're, you've expressed at their last meeting an intention for a five-year renewal period, and I expect that the Planning Commission will agree with that, and that's what you'll be taking action on. And that's the, the actual fee structure is silent on the, the renewal frequency, but the board letter said annual, yes. Yeah, so that it won't be annual. It'll be whatever the ordinance requires. Thank you. Any others? Uh, seeing none, I'll open it up to see if there's anyone who wants to testify about the unified fee schedule. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Joaquin Casilla. I prepared a very short statement. I'm a, a resident here of uh, Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz, and I'm a program coordinator for uh, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. That's a nonprofit agency that in Watsonville that works with uh, uh, on preventing substance abuse uh, in regards to um, our students down there. So first, I would like to thank uh, the board for passing the alcohol beverage retail outlet ordinance. I work directly with these families and the youth, and I know the positive impact that measures such as this have directly on them. So. I'm also here to advocate for the full funding of the ordinance so that education and enforcement operations could be adequately implemented to benefit the, the community's health and safety. As we know, similar ordinances such as a tobacco retail license fee, um, adequate funding for comprehensive uh, implementation is key in ensuring the substance are not sold to minors and that retailers are educated on best practices. So. Um, all the components of the ordinance, so monitoring, education, uh, enforcement, um, all work together to ensure that these uh, measures um, are successful. So therefore, uh, there should be um, funding enough to support two officers, a deputy, and a program coordinator. And furthermore, uh, I work with youth down in Watsonville as well, and uh, we're hoping that you know, your action here today and your leadership here today will also incentivize them to adopt uh, similar measures to protect the community down there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jenna Shankman, uh, coordinator with Community Prevention Partners and community organizer at United Way. Uh, I just want to thank the, the board for adopting the alcohol um, ordinance and um, providing this tool in the community and kind of echo um, some of the points that Joaquin was saying of just the importance of having all the, the components which really need to be um, supported by the two officers, the deputy and the program coordinator in order to um, be able to go kind kind of through the full spectrum of the yearly compliance checks, also providing the technical assistance and education and correction of any um, thing that's out of compliance, um, as well as enforcement um, when necessary to really build that relationship and really have um, an in-depth program to address some of the um, alcohol-fueled health and safety issues in the community that we spoke about of length um, during the last meeting when that ordinance was adopted. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. My name is Casey Conway. I'm with Applied Survey Research. I was here um, last month presenting uh, some of the data from our study on um, the um, place of last drink of um, individuals who um, were arrested for DUIs. And um, I just wanted to reiterate our, our top line results of that, which, which showed that uh, about 47% of all the um, DUIs that um, we, we learned about um, origin, um, came from an, a, a bar or restaurant establishment. Um, and I'd also just like to say, um, we are an independent organization, so I'm not gonna weigh in on, on the on in policy and regulatory questions other than to say as a research organization, we value um, any policies that are, that where data collection is gonna be involved that it, where we can be as consistent and rigorous in the, in the policy as possible so that our data uh, reflects, um, is, so we're e better able to, um, to understand the, um, the effects of those policies through the data that it's consistent and then the, the staff and the implementation are, uh, are very consistent. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. afternoon, Supervisor Rudy Escalante, Santa Cruz County resident uh, with Janice of Santa Cruz. Uh, conceptually, I support the idea as well. I think uh, my experience who supervised and managed an alcohol enforcement unit while I was at Santa Cruz, we had a lot of positive relationships with the business people. They were able to use us as a resource, the alcohol enforcement unit, when they were ha having trouble with either underage drinking or shoulder tapping or uh, people with fake IDs that were trying to uh, purchase alcohol at their business and we were able to respond much more quickly with them. We were able to help them with training opportunities and design around their landscape to prevent uh, criminal activity. So we it developed a really good partnership with them. Uh, the trust level became uh, much, much higher and it was just an all around win-win for everyone. So conceptually I support the idea just uh, based on my experience over the years. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos Hills. Um, I have questions about the public works um, change in fees, uh, that there would be no roadside improvement fees charged when there's no parking required. That speaks to the ADU issue, I think. And um, I know that the law is that uh, parking is not required for ADUs when it is located within a half mile of public transportation, but how will that be um, um, rectified, I guess, for lack of better words, if um, the occupant of the ADU does have a car or cars. So um, I'd like some discussion about that. Uh, what if there are cars? And um, in the packet, there was no trip generation rate schedule um, information provided, as was alluded to in the document. I also want to thank the probation department for not charging youth and their families for being involved in the juvenile uh, delinquency system, and I'm glad that now that's being expunged completely. I want to also uh, chime in on the alcohol nuisance <coughs> abatement fees and hope that a good amount of these efforts and resources go to sting operations. I think those are very effective that ripples out and um, has effects beyond the um, area. I wonder how um, the, what the rate of charge will be for gasoline stations. I see a lot of alcohol bought at gasoline stations and people get in the car and open one up and off they go. So um, I would like to know how that will be addressed and I also wanna make sure that a good amount of effort gets put forth to the education of the ABC requirements required staff um, education that and training that was discussed a lot here when your board considered this uh, by ABC um, um, certificate holders that it's very difficult, it's required, but it's difficult to get their staff down to Salinas when there's really l no resources there to do it. So this is a step, I think, in the right direction to help make our roads safer, to help educate uh, people and our youth. And um, again, I wanna point out that it's become very trendy to drink at all of the brew pubs and wineries that the county is licensing. Um, in closing, I just want to say that uh, regarding the hosted rental, I have a question as to why a renewal would cost more than an original application. And um, I'll look forward to hearing these answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Jen O'Brien Rojo and I'm here wearing several hats. I'm the chair of the Community Prevention Partners and also a small business owner and a parent. Um, so lots of hats there. As a small business owner, I fully understand the impact um, that fees and taxes have on a small business. And as a small business owner, I also understand that my community provides me with my livelihood. And it's really my duty to step up and support that community that supports me and supports my family. And I'm in full support of the alcohol ordinance and coming up with and supporting this fee structure. Um, and as it's a way for our government and our business community and our community in general to come together and to tell our young people that they matter, that they actually do matter more than profit. They matter 70 cents to 10 bucks a day. Because when you break down that fee structure, for example, if a business is open five days a week, I know lots of them are open seven, but five is the easier number, right? 260 days a year, you divide that, it's between 70 cents and $10 a day. And our young people are worth that. And I think this tells them that, that from our government, as well as our community, we're acknowledging that they're worth that. Um, and they depend on us to step up and to make that statement together as a business community and, and as our government, as our community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to our board for action or discussion. Uh, so in, for, I mean, I guess we should answer the question about the hosted fee renewal. I know the answer, but we should. <laughs> well, as envisioned, the initial um, hosted rental permit is basically kind of checklist. Do you comply with the second time around? With you know, probably five years later, um, that will be when we review the the report, which would be, I guess, a five-year report of activity. So there's additional steps involved. That also tends to be programmatically, we're going to get some questions and. Uh, request for information and complaints, et cetera, from surrounding neighbors and, and the community. And so there's additional time programmatically to engage with and respond to all those questions and concerns of the community. And so that those costs are spread over the cost of the renewal permits. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, sure, so it, I'm in favor of moving the fee schedule with the exception of the alcohol um, fees because it doesn't reflect, I think, the direction that I gave in the last meeting that was supported by a majority of the board, which was to come back with a fee program similar to the city of Santa Cruz. And by that, I meant to have a tier, but also have it cost the same so that, as I said, if you're not a winery on one side of 7th Avenue and a winery on the other side of 7th Avenue, you aren't getting charged more than three times as much for the same service. And I think from my experience in the city of Santa Cruz, the alcohol uh, program operates there. It operates well. We heard from business owners, we heard from the police that it operates well. Um, and in the city, you have more high risk, uh, you have a similar number of outlets, but you have more high risk uh, venues uh, than you do in the county. And so I, um, I'm, I'm glad we have this ordinance. I think it's really important, and I think it's important that it's funded by fees, but I think the fees should be commiserate, we're a small county, they should be commiserate with the city of Santa Cruz where we've heard testimony that the program really works. So uh, we should be following that model in terms of costs and, and structure. So I'll make a motion to approve the uni uh, unified fee schedule, uh, continuing the, uh, with the exception of the alcohol fee, uh, <laughs> alcohol retailer fee uh, to return the next uh, board meeting in January uh, with a uh, with a structure in cost with a, that's similar in cost and structure to the city of Santa Cruz. So there's a motion by Coonerty. I'll second it. Uh, uh, Supervisor Friend seconds it. Let's have some discussion. I know I have some comments. I'm not sure if others do. I have some questions, that's okay. okay. Sure. Uh, do we have a definition of what a small grocery market is versus a large grocery market? Supervisors, good afternoon. Craig Wilson, Operations Chief of the Sheriff's Office. Um, for purposes of um, this ordinance, um, we are looking at um, initially probably 5,000 square feet or more 
to be the difference between a large market and a convenience store, a small market, something like that. So there are 12 uh, markets in the unincorporated area that are larger than 5,000 square feet. Um, and there are a number of convenience stores that are less than that. So, I, okay, uh, in regards then to that question, if you were um, a 6,000 square foot grocery store, um, but you had a very small alcohol section because it wasn't primary to what you did versus say a Safeway, um, there's no price differential between that store and a Safeway? There is not. Okay. Um, I still think, I, okay. I'm still, um, I appreciate, by the way, I appreciate that there was an attempt to go back and tier the fees. I do think that it's still, um, I don't, I'm not totally sold yet on the nexus, but I do, I do think that um, uh, there needs to be, well, if the motion is, is to really work on the, the city's structure works on intensive, on uh, the type of, uh, what would be the best way to describe this, but basically the nexus directly between what that outlet is and the, the issues that it causes in the community. Um, square footage may not necessarily be the only way to do that. I mean, I think you know that better than I would. Uh, but I do think there's a second component here. What, what I'm concerned is going to happen um, uh, to Supervisor Coonerty's motion is if we come back with a City of Santa Cruz uh, model that the general fund will just be asked to make up the rest. I think that, that what needs to be introduced into the motion is a little bit more complexity about how we define what the funding will be because if we harmonize just with a, by definition, if something's half as expensive in the city, it'll bring in half the amount of revenue um, right now. Um, and I assume that there's not gonna be, there isn't a proposal from the Sheriff's Office to scale the program back, correct? Could you, um, what do you mean by scale it back? So if, if the amount of, if, if we came back with a City of Santa Cruz revenue structure that brought in say $100,000 as opposed to 204,000, <clears> um, you wouldn't create a $100,000 program, you would request that the general fund make up the difference for the other 100,000, correct? It is correct to say that we've identified one deputy sheriff full-time and one program coordinator full-time in order to run an effective program. Okay. I'll open it up. For, I want to make sure other people have a chance to speak. I may want to uh, speak yeah. some more on it. Thank, thank you, Chief. Supervisor yeah. McPherson. Yeah, I, I'm kind of on track, too. This is um, a countywide problem, I, I think, um, or issue that we should be addressed. And I, I too, am, am not sure that we should put it all on the the outlets or restaurants or whatever it may be. I think it might be best to see if we can get a share of it uh, covered by the general fund. I think it's a big hit on a lot of, well, um, outlets that um, this time around I didn't hear much of because frankly I've heard this was not gonna be discussed today and it was gonna be discussed later and so I don't think I've heard from some of the others about this other this new tiered um, fee schedule. Uh, so I, I'm a little hesitant to go ahead with it right now. Um, I'd, I'd like to you know, look into what Supervisor Friend had said, you know, about what, what it would mean for us if we wanted to share this uh, general fund and the, the stores, restaurants, nightclubs, whatever the case may be. I just, I, I have a couple comments. Uh, first of all, there was no uh, clear direction uh, other than creating uh, more sophisticated tiers than what we had last time. And so this uh, was an honest attempt to do that. The, the issues in the county are different than the issues in the city. Um, and it has to do with, you know, how compact the area is. You know, we have to, we're gonna have one officer who's gonna have to visit 260 outlets they're not in a, a, a five block range, right? They're, they're, in, they're 40 miles apart and you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the winery up in the hills of Coralitas or, uh, or a winery in, um, in um, you know, the Davenport area, that's, you, you gotta cover some miles. So there, there are different costs. Um, plus uh, in the, um, in the county area, we don't have uh, the same kind of law enforcement uh, on duty at any one time that they do in the city per capita. 
The other uh, part about this, uh, I would say, is uh, one of the reasons why this was an attractive way to uh, address a problem, a clear problem in our community, uh, is that we have models in which we've done this before. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the needle manufacturers, tobacco retailers, uh, even the, um, the garbage uh, trucks pay a fee to cover the, 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 to deal with the harm that they create. Um, and the, this fee structure is very similar to the other, uh, to the vast majority of the other fees that uh, are charged statewide, that they don't completely cover. This would not completely cover the cost, but it covers a good portion of the cost. And that's what we ask when we ask the pharmaceuticals or the needle manufacturers or the garbage company or the tobacco retailers. That's how, that's how we do it. This is in keeping with uh, a, a standard that we have for lots of other areas. Um, we're gonna be hearing a, a uh, presentation in our next item about what the budget looks like into the future. And, you know, it's, it should give us pause. Um, uh, I think after talking with the sheriff and staff that to effectively run this program, they have the minimal, the most minimal staffing they could possibly have. Two people to cover 260 outlets, uh, to do an effective tr uh, training program, to to do an effective investigation, to, uh, to have adequate enforcement. And in keeping with the models in which we've used in other places, I, I think it's realistic to uh, ask um, uh, those who make money from uh, the alcohol to help pay for a portion of it. Uh, there are probably lots of places where our, our fee schedule does not sync up with the city of Santa Cruz. And, um, and one of the things in my, my original conception of this ordinance was that charge one fee for everybody uh, because we were trying to keep the administrative costs down and, and to get the actual work done. And after conversation with the business community and conversations with the board, it, it has expanded. But when you, when you expand, it means that someone's gonna pay a little less, someone's gonna pay a little bit more. And uh, that's, that, that's the nature of having tears. Um, and so I, I think it's um, to, to, to just simply try to match what the city has is, um, may not be the most effective model. And it, it will require that it has a bigger general fund participation, which, uh, you know, I, um, I, I don't think is necessary. Uh, I mean, I don't, if, if, that, if the board's direction is to have the general fund uh, pick it up, then, uh, you know, that's the board's direction, but I think there's an opportunity based on our previous models to have those that contribute the harm, ha contribute some part of the harm to our community help pay for the cost of the program. So, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that. And thank you for those comments. I, I just wanna comment on a couple of things here. I, I wasn't, uh, in fact, I was directly saying the opposite regarding uh, the general fund. In fact, I'd like to amend the motion to specifically say that the general fund not contribute. Uh, to this, considering that be a, a friendly amendment. Friendly. Um, th that wasn't the uh, intention. Uh, I, well, I'll explain in a second. Wait a minute, I, I, so you just made an amendment to the... Uh... To his original motion, yeah, that the general fund not be a, a, a contribution in, in this. So that wasn't my, I, I wasn't arguing to have this be a general fund cost. The point that you raise is, is exactly right, that they're not one for one as far as uh, the city and the county, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, but I'm also aware in briefly reviewing the ASR data that, you know, the last drink from the wineries was one person, one person. So, I don't know, I mean, if one person every winery gets charged $200, is that a, I mean, if we're doing a nexus, like the city actually does a nexus, they say that if you're the catalyst, you have a certain number of calls for service and you create a certain number of problems, you're gonna pay uh, a lot more than somebody that doesn't. Uh, Corralitos Market in my district, which is by no stretch is a major alcohol purveyor, but it's 5,500 square feet is the same price as Safeway. I, I, I don't, I mean, so I'm not. Not accurate, but if you, if you look at the list, it's not accurate. But it is 5,500 square feet, and if 5,000 square feet's the cutoff, then it would be the same price as, as Safeway. So uh, that's why I'd asked that question about the square footage earlier. And so I, but yet, 
I, I don't think that, and considering that, you know, they're, they sell mostly local wines at, at astronomical prices, and so I don't think a lot of people are, are going there to, uh, I don't think they're contributing a lot of alcohol-related problems to the community. It's just sort of my point, right, where I think that, that we may be in agreement about a 7-Eleven, we're, we're in agreement about nightclubs or, or, or bars like uh, which we have in our, in our districts. And so what I'm trying to do is harmonize the fees. This is what I thought, we had a pretty extensive discussion the last time and I appreciate that you, that you had, that your interpretation of the, of the direction was just to have tiers. I left with the same impression that Supervisor Coonerty did that we were more specific than that. And even at the last board meeting when we had the second reading of the ordinance on consent, Supervisor McPherson made a very specific statement that he was only supporting the, the ordinance with the understanding that we'd be coming back with a reasonable fee structure. So I think it's fair to have the discussion about the fee structure, about what the interpretation of reasonable is. I think it's fair uh, that we had spoken specifically about the city as a model by which that be what it based on, what it be based on. So I, we, we may have a, a recollection difference on that, but that, that was, that's what it was. But I would say it was a 5-0 vote to create the ordinance. It's not like there isn't support to actually create this. We, we've all in agreement that that, that we should give these additional tools to the sheriff's office. It's just a simple uh, question of whether 200 plus thousand dollars is a regional op reasonable operational cost, whether uh, this distribution really correlates, uh, or even more than correlates, but uh, it has a strong nexus to the impacts that are created by these individuals, that's all. I mean, I think that that's what the discussion is, is about right now, uh, which is why I'm in agreement with, with uh, Supervisor Coonerty's uh, motion with that amendment. Uh, I think it's, you know, uh, 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 I try to listen to the law enforcement professionals who talk about what it takes to run a, this program effectively. And to put a, a, a cap um, on, uh, on saying no general fund participation, um, but then say you can't charge enough fees to, 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 to operate the program, be clear about what you're doing. You are not you are, you, are, you are not running an effective program. You are limiting the ability of this program to be ex successful. You cannot have it both ways and say, I support the program, it makes sense, I've seen it work, and, and then not provide enough resources to actually do it well. So, uh, you know, I, I, you know we, can, we can continue to, to, to tinker with um, the, uh, the fee schedule and I encourage the active involvement of my colleagues in coming up with a, a, a fee schedule that they would f find to be useful or amenable. But um, don't pretend that you, th that, that you support this program and the sheriff and all the community partners that, that do this work that support this program and all of our alcohol and drug commissioners who support this program and say we're gonna, have a, 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 we're gonna do that program if you will not provide the, the funding. There is a way to pay for this and to get those who, who sell alcohol, who make money from alcohol, who have a responsibility to help uh, pay for the harm that it creates to our community, which is considerable, um, to pay for the program, but to also limit the general fund, you, you just can't have it both ways. I guess, I mean, we're all in support of the program. We're all in support of having significant funding go to the program. I don't want sheriffs driving up to Davenport to talk to wineries about shoulder tapping. That doesn't seem like a good use of resources. Focus on what I'm trying to do is scale this back. We also heard from all the, uh, all, everyone who testified last week, they don't want the training programs because they can go online and get the training programs as mandated by the state. So we don't have to provide a training program. It, this doesn't seem to be a, uh, it doesn't seem to be, if you, we get COPS grants all the time, we get uh, f drug Medi-Cal grants all the time that say, here's a grant, do as much as you can do. There's either, uh, uh, this may not be enough, but you can implement the program, uh, and then the grants go away, and then we figure out whether we want to do it. So the question is, can we go from nothing to a 100,000, I'm not even sure what the number is, $100,000 a year program to address a very real problem? And if, if it is a major driver, if, if a couple outlets are a major driver, of, of, of police calls, can we dedicate, can we redirect existing resources to those sting operations that are major public safety 
um, violations. It's, I, I just, we just, I mean, we've, we've heard over from, in testimony that the city of Santa Cruz, one with the same number of outlets work, other than drive time, there's less high risk, there's less shoulder tapping, there's less, uh, there's less issues with, uh, you know, late hours. So can we then have those similar resources apply in a way that, uh, that works and see how it works? And if, and if in a year from now, we, we, we have shoulder tapping and other things going on all over the county and we need to increase the fees, we can increase the fees, but let's see if we can make it an impact on the places that are causing the most um, damage to our community. I don't remember the data about shoulder tapping being less in the county than it is in the, in the city. Is, was that data that was presented at some point? No, uh, no, no I'm, uh, assu uh, I'm uh, assuming but, uh, uh, that 20,000 college students, half of whom are underage, are out shoulder tapping more often uh, by just the demographic percentage in the city than they are uh, in the unincorporated areas. Um, uh, the, it, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pass on saying about what I guess and, and try to point to the data. It's clear that we're, you wouldn't have the same program at a Davenport Winery as you do at a bar in Aptos. I mean, the, the, it, it isn't a one-size-fits-all program. The officers would use the, the, um, their knowledge the, and their awareness and their skills to be able to work with individual retailers. We did hear um, that individual retailers like the interaction in the, in the city of Santa Cruz. And so it's, it's, it's that communication and education and, um, and connection that strengthens the relationship. It's not about uh, um, uh, just simply looking at the high risk outlets, right? I mean, that uh, we've, we, if we acknowledge that we have a problem here in Santa Cruz, I think that the sheriff's office has been smart enough to know that the castaways on Portola might, or the Over the Hill Gang Saloon might cause more problems than uh, Cafe Cruise. Um, and, you know, because their hours and everything else, th maybe th they uh, allocate resources that way. But in trying to figure out how we can make a dent in the impact that alcohol makes, this is the, th these are the tools in which law enforcement has told us they want. And um, I'm just trying to make sure that we fund an effective program instead of uh, uh, funding half a program and then go, see, it didn't work. It makes no sense. Other others. Um, Can I ask a question? You may know the answer, which is, uh, or actually, Chief, if you wouldn't mind, you, you would know the answer to this. Of the, of the total staff, the two staff, what's the breakdown of the two from a salary standpoint so I know where the 250-ish thousand comes from? I think it's 204,000 of revenue, but I know there was some that was. We need approximately 217,000 in revenue for the two positions, and the program coordinator uh, accounts for about 85,000 of that. Okay, and but you are you do actually have three staff technically, and one of them you're just absorbing within the current budget. That's a special investigations lieutenant, correct? Just as a manager level. Uh, all supervision and management will be done with existing resources. Add will some as well some value adds that we talked about earlier when the new investigators should it be funded coordinates with patrol and some other resources for some of these activities because as uh, Supervisor Leopold mentioned, the county and the city comparison isn't exact with the, not only the distances but the usage patterns and, and impact and densities are, are all different and that's why I have some reservations about adopting uh, the city of Santa Cruz alcohol fee structure, um, just bringing it across as it is, I'm, I'm not sure it will work. Um, like it does for the city. Thank you. Uh, Chief Wilson, um, if, you, if you only had half the amount of money for this program, what would it look like? Would you be able to um, do it? Well, probably not, and that's, that's because to have the program the most, I mean, the enforcement and, and, and part of the outreach is done by a deputy sheriff. The program is gonna be funded uh, it's, it sounds like, based on at least two of your uh, thoughts, um, by a fee structure that's substantially 
gets that. In order to have that fee structure, you know, someone has to do a billing cycle and a receipt cycle and a scheduling cycle for inspections. I mean, there's quite a lot of, of administrative infrastructure with the program. And what we learned uh, when we talked to some of the other 20, 19, 20, 21 jurisdictions that have this is that having an administrative support by whatever its name and a, and a police officer is the most common combination to have. Um, there's just, it's not just a matter of a police officer going out and doing this work, it's, it's not random work. Um, between the inspection cycle and the undercover work, there's some planning involved and, and administering a fee structure, uh, collecting revenues, uh, keeping out notices on uh, new applications. That, that's all administrative work that someone needs to do and the police officer is not the most ideal person to do that for a variety of reasons. So um, you mentioned uh, wineries. There, there's probably 17 according to the, uh, that have tasting and or off on-site sales, or off-site sales according to the uh, representative that came out from the wineries. So you can see that this fee structure that we put into play, because we were listening closely to some of your concerns, the winery is coming at 200 annually. Uh, and so if you, if you removed, if you chose to remove that, we're looking at a very small amount of revenue for the entire program. Um, however, there are some advantages by keeping all alcohol outlets in, and it has to do something with the education component. So as you look up, I mean, my experience is that uh, large markets have a lot of calls. They may not all be necessarily alcohol related directly, but there's a great deal of activity, and the larger the market, the larger the activity that we go to. Um, without naming specifics, I can, I can think of two large markets in the unincorporated area that account for hundreds of calls um, constantly. Um, and, you know, I, when you apply this fee structure, there's going to be some discretion in how we do this. There has to be. That's the nature of, um, of, of any program of this nature. So the information that I got from the assessor's file puts the market that you had some concern with at less than 5,000 square feet, and that's why I didn't make the list of 12 markets that are known to me that have um, that. So those are the kind of things that, you know, we would need some fee structure to, uh, we would actually need to go in detail into the probably 260 to 270 outlets, it depends exactly how you measure them, to fit them in the category. Some are quite obvious and some are a little bit more challenging but we would apply fair and consistent rules and hear back from outlets that uh, wanted to present material that, that they were miscategorized. So um, it, it wasn't that we didn't listen to any direction that you were at at the last hearing, but I didn't hear that you were looking for an identical structure as the city of Santa Cruz, and I'm not sure that it can work. There may be variations of it. I wonder if there would be a friendly amendment to to have it come back the fee schedule and have uh, the sheriff's office and the CAO's office work to see if there's a way to fund this program, uh, so you could actually have it rather than just saying no no uh, general fund. That, that seems uh, like a level of severity that we don't have on anything else. And if we acknowledge that it's a good program. Um, there may be opportunities to think about ways in which that can be done. Go ahead. I mean, I, I'm not married to the exact structure of Santa Cruz. I'm just trying to have it be roughly comparable. So if you're a restaurant in Santa Cruz and you're a restaurant in the unincorporated area, it's roughly the same fee. Um, my understanding was it's not, I'm, we're not saying don't spend general fund resources, so cut the program. We're saying don't spend don't come with a proposal to bring new general fund resources. But if, but if, but if you have five markets or that are generating hundreds of calls uh, and you want to reallocate some source resources for an operation that reduces those calls, obviously that makes sense. So, um, so if, if, if the direction to the CIO's office and the, and the sheriff's office is to work on a, on a fee schedule that's, that's, that takes into account um, the, uh, uh, what is it, the city's does is, I can show you the um, takes into account the risk and the volume 
uh, and uh, and is and has comparable rates uh, then and doesn't uh, require a new general fund. I'm supportive of that. I don't uh, then. Uh I'm just trying to figure out, if you say no, no new general fund money, um, you are saying that either the fees have to figure out a way to pay for it, which you don't appear to be saying, because the, 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 uh, uh, Chief Wilson has said that that will not do it, um, and then just come up with it somewhere else. So you would like them to cut some other part of the sheriff's budget to pay for this? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if, if if we care about a program, let's figure out how we pay for it and not put unnecessary restrictions. Let's let uh, the two, uh, the, the CAO's office, the Sheriff's Department, try to see if they can put something together without those kind of um, uh, 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 severe restrictions and then come back to us. Carlos, I mean, Mr. Palacios. Yes, um, I think um, we understand uh, the general direction you want in terms of the fee structure and the program, so let us have a chance at it, and we'd be happy to work with the Sheriff's Office and see if we come, come up with a compromise that tries to meet the, um, the differing goals that the Board has but still has a successful program. So I think we could um, have our analysts meet with the Sheriff and see if we can come up with something that could be a um, sustainable uh, compromise that would also be a successful program. Uh, if, if we're clear on that, uh, you know, uh, maybe you want to restate the motion so we're clear on what it is we're voting on. Then. Sure. So I'm moving the unified uh, fee schedule with the exception of the alcohol sales uh, permit fees, which will, uh, which the CAO's office and the sheriff's office will return to us in the first meeting in January. Um, trying to develop a fee structure that is uh, tiered and is comparable to the city of Santa Cruz. Could we uh, just make that the second meeting in January? Give sure. us a little the bit more time. Thank second you. meeting in January. So is the, is the clerk clear on what the action is and is the second exactly. clear? Is the rest of the board clear? Um, any other comments? Uh, then let's vote. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Um, I look forward to this coming back on the second meeting in January. I appreciate the support from uh, the community members and the sheriff's office in the creation of this program. So we'll move on to the final item um, on today's budget, which is item number 64, which is consider the county preliminary budget projection report and study session for fiscal year 2018-19 and provide any additional direction or priorities for the FY 2018-19 proposed budget as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. A brief break as we get all the chairs back in the original location. And there is a one more item after this one. Different chair, Mr. Palacios. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer, uh, Chair Leopold, and members of the board. Uh, what we're doing today is giving you a, a preliminary budget overview. Um, normally, we do this uh, mid year in February, uh, usually the first or second meeting of February, and the auditor controller, um, along with the CAO's office, gives a presentation. The issue is that uh, we do that because of the timing of the financial data being available to us. 
And so that's why it ends up being second meeting of February often, because that's when we have the results from the first part of the year, and that gives us the most accurate financial update. The only issue is that when we try and get um, input from the board on the makeup of the following year's budget, uh, it's already late in the process, because by February, uh, the departments have already pretty much are very much deeply into their budget development. And so typically we issue budget instructions right now in December. And so that's why we want to do, uh, separate the, separate the uh, two presentations a little bit, um, which would provide you to get a um, preliminary uh, view of the budget and provide any input you might have um, prior to us uh, giving the budget instructions out. And just to give you the heads up about what our budget instructions are going to be for the coming year. So that's the um, impetus for this um, budget presentation occurring at this time. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to be uh, in the county administrative office. We're going to be presenting uh, an overview of the 2017-18 budget. That's our current fiscal year, uh, next, next fiscal year's uh, preliminary forecast, and then our five-year forecast. We'll also go over a number of emerging issues, uh, including uh, we have the Director um, of Human Services, Ellen Timberlake, and uh, Director of Health Services Agency, Jang Wen, who will be giving uh, impacts on their departments, which have significant uh, issues coming up in the budget year. So if I could summarize um, the whole agenda from the county administrator's point of view, uh, the basic summary is that in this year, 1718, we have a balanced budget, and that's good news. Uh, with that, that uh, basically assumes that we don't any have any major new initiatives. Uh, for next fiscal year, 2018-19, uh, we have a balanced budget with significant belt tightening. Um, and then the following year, um, in going out five years, uh, we have uh, potential uh, budget deficits. So that's the summary of the overall presentation. I thought I'd give you a preview of that. So if you look at our budget for this year, you can see our, our general fund is almost half a billion dollars at this point, uh, and our total, bun, total uh, budget, all funds, is almost um, three quarters of a billion dollars. So we're getting to be uh, in a very big uh, budget, and you can see that the general fund uh, is a significant uh, portion of that overall budget. If you look at the general fund, you'll see that uh, basically half of it is uh, intergovernmental revenue. So as a county, which is typical of counties, we're very dependent on federal and state revenues. Um, so that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. And then the other thing we keep in mind is that of the half that is not intergovernmental revenues, uh, almost half of that portion is taxes, and most of that is property tax. So 26% of the entire budget is, um, is taxes, but if you look at just the part, just that half that is not um, intergovernmental, you can see it's very significant, it's almost half is, is our taxes, and that mostly is property tax. Um, every year uh, we have uh, fund balance um, in, in good years, and this is um, how uh, we begin the year, is with the uh, prior year fund balance, and it is composed of um, three main things. One is that um, we have been having um, general purpose revenues above our projections, so we uh, don't project our revenues conservatively, we don't project them optimistically, we make a middle of the road projection in our revenues. Uh, but they have been coming in ahead of that, better than that, better than moderate um, projections. And so we've been having a uh, fund balance partly due to our revenues, mainly property tax, but also hotel tax, sales tax, um, outperforming our projections. So that's one piece. And then the other piece is we have uh, cost savings. Cost savings are two pieces, make up cost savings. One of them is salary savings. Um, which we project every year as part of the budget, and then the other, uh, and that's due to people, staff turnover, right, and the, and the time it takes to hire a new person, and then also just um, operating expenses that are not spent, they're called reversions, general uh, operating reversions. So between um, operating budgets uh, that are not spent 
and then um, salary savings, that makes up about 24% of our fund balance. And then we also have contingencies uh, that luckily we have not had to spend that makes up part of it. So in 2016-17, our fund balance was actually $12.4 million, which was, was high. It was actually, and this is about as good as it gets for us. Our normal fund balance uh, that we would expect is in the range of about $6 million. So we almost doubled that. And you can see that um, when you look at the sources of that, uh, seven million of that was general purpose revenues above what we projected. So this is more than we, this is growth beyond our projections. Um, and then cost savings, both reversions and both salary savings of about $3 million, and then our contingencies, which we did not have to spend and therefore rolled over. So this is the money that was available to roll over into 1718. And we took, uh, or the board took, half of that $12.4 million, $6.1 million, put it into reserves, and that's how we were able to get our reserves up to uh, ahead of schedule to meet our 10%. And then we also um, put that, the rest of the remainder, 6.3 to roll over into the next fiscal year. So in 17, 18, we started uh, basically with that fund balance of $6.3 million. These are our general uh, purpose revenues and you can see that uh, the great majority of these are taxes and that uh, the great majority of that is property tax. This is our expenditures uh, in the general fund, and you can see that about half of them uh, are uh, salaries and benefits. Um, you'll also um, note that there's um, our services and supplies, there's only 26% uh, of the budget, and so that's, uh, so it just shows you how, when you have a budget problem, how it's hard to cut, because a lot of it is, um, salaries and benefits or services and supplies or contracts that are, that are hard for us to, to reduce. So this is our general fund operating history um, going back uh, almost 10 years. And basically uh, you can see that uh, we had a, a gap in the Great Recession 2008-2009. Uh, we actually had a um, completely balanced budget in 10, 000, FY10-11, that was when we had furloughs in place. And then we had a gap that's been uh, cruising around um, somewhere around six to $10 million. It's currently about $6 million. Uh, and we've been covering, and that's not a significant amount. It's only about uh, one or 2% of our budget. So it's not a huge amount. And we've been covering that gap. Uh, in the past, we've called that our structural deficit. It's our de gap between recurring revenues, recurring expenditures. Uh, right now, it's about $6 million approximately. And we've been covering that, as you can see, last year we had $12 million of fund, bill, fund balance, right? And we were able to roll over six, half of that. So that's how we've been covering that, that gap. Uh, look, this is the net county cost. So this is uh, a very important uh, chart uh, because this is basically in the general fund those uh, expenditures that are not covered by fees and that are covered by general purpose revenues. And you can see it's grown up to $141 million. And you can see that the majority of that is public safety of the net county cost. And then you can see uh, that we also have health and human services, uh, which is about 18%. Uh, those are very difficult to cut as you, um, as you know. Uh, and also the health and human services money, that contribution is used to leverage a lot of state and federal funds. So it's very difficult to cut. So you can see when we uh, have a budget deficit, the difficulty we face is that when you, this is really all the discretion you have over. If you cut, uh, the rest of the general fund is either subvented from state and federal money, right, about half of it, and then the rest is covered by fees. So if you cut that, you don't, you don't get any savings, right? If you cut something that is fee-based, you don't save any because you lose the revenue. If you cut something that's subvented through federal and state funds, you don't make any money because you lose, that's to federal or state funds. So really all you have is the net county cost and you can see the majority of this, again, is public safety or, or it's in health and human services, which is leveraging other, uh, other funds. So this is our um, current year budget estimate, and you can see that we're um, on track to still generate a fund balance. We're doing a little bit better than uh, we projected. So th the left column, 2017-18 budget, you can see that we had prior year fund balance of $6.3 million. 
uh, revenues are performing a little bit better uh, than when we uh, originally projected. Um, we have basically a million dollars more in revenues that we're projecting at year end, a little bit less than we've been having in the past, but it's still in the positive range. And then we are uh, also projecting some savings in our expenditures of about $4 million. So about $1 million in new revenue, about $4 million in savings, both from budget reversions and salary savings. And so we're projecting having a fund balance carryover of about $5.2 million, which is what we've been, in general, about $6 million has been what we've been averaging in terms of fund balance carryover. The, um, the hard thing about this is that in a recession, uh, revenues start, they stop outperforming your estimates and start underperforming, so you get a negative there. And then you, your reversions and your salary savings also go down because people stop leaving. Right now, people, there's churn in the workforce because people are getting um, job offers in other counties and other cities, and so there's turnover, right? Uh, in a recession, people have salary free, uh, hiring freezes, and so you don't get those budget reversions, salary savings, your revenues don't come down, and suddenly this uh, fund balance is not generated. Uh, now looking to 2018-19, uh, um, we are um, projecting that we can have a, a balanced budget, but it's going to take some belt tightening. And basically, uh, we're projecting that our revenues will continue to grow um, as they have been, a little bit slower than they have been in the past, about 4%, that we would increase any fees to cover costs. Uh, that we would have um, the fund balance to bring over, uh, as we are estimate, about $5 million. We have some cannabis growth that we're projecting. We'll go over that a little bit later. Uh, there's also some loss of grant funding, which um, will hurt us a little bit. Uh, our expenditures are growing. Um, we have salary and benefit costs for existing staff, and we have some risks um, that we are going to talk about a little bit later from PERS rate increases and also uh, state uh, and other emerging issues which our uh, Department of Health Services and Human Services will talk about. So PERS is uh, a growing issue not only for us but for um, pretty much every jurisdiction across the state that contracts with PERS uh, because their rates are going up uh, significantly over the next six years. So. Um, that is one of the realities that we're going to have to deal with and that's really going to define um, the, next, uh, the next six years. Uh, you can see that basically um, PERS rates, and these are, the blue line is miscellaneous, and then the green line is, um, is safety, and then the sort of the teal line is um, the share of um, safety. And so miscellaneous is projected to grow, uh, it's right now about 19.5% of the employer rate. It ex it's expected to grow to almost 30% in six years. Uh, safety is growing from 27% to 43%. And you can see the sheriff uh, safety is growing from 39% to almost 59%. So very significant cost increases. Uh, if these cost increases turn out as projected, as a total county, we would have to absorb almost $30 million in new uh, PERS costs over the six-year period. Uh, $25 million of that would be in the general fund. And so uh, what is driving those rate increases? Um, basically, there's three main factors. One is the uh, earnings rate that PERS is having in their investments. They call this the discount rate. Um, a, num a few years ago, it was 7.75 that they were using to project how much they were going to earn in their investments. So when we give them money, we pay a bill, they take that money and they invest it. They were projecting 7.75. They reduced that um, to 7.5% a couple of years ago, and they're now going to reduce it to 7%. So that reduction from 7.5% to 7% in their earnings projections that PERS uh, is using in their formulas is one very big factor. Another is the amortization of the losses from the Great Recession. In the Great Recession of 2009, PERS lost uh, billions of dollars and they amortized those losses over 30 years. Uh, they've changed that amortization from 30 years to 20 years. And so the shortening of that period is also causing the rates to increase. And then the third factor is demographic changes. Basically, we're um, 
uh, living longer than projected. Uh, what they, the PERS um, demographers are saying that we are living basically uh, every decade we're adding another uh, two years in longevity at this point. And what that means is that uh, the baby boom Russian uh, retirement is gonna have a big impact on the demographics of PERS. Right now there's six current employees for every retiree, uh, as we stay today, as we uh, stand today. In 30 years, PERS projects that there will be one retiree for one current employee. It'll be one to one instead of six to one. So that's another uh, factor, and that's just to increase in longevity as we get older, right? Our, our, um, we're living longer than projected. So um, all of those factors, uh, those three factors have combined to make the rate increases. So every, every jurisdiction is having to deal with this and, and that is really what's driving uh, our cost increases or, or a big part of our cost increases. So if you look at uh, the 2018-19 preliminary budget uh, projections, uh, we're projecting prior year fund balance again of about $5 million, revenue growth of about 3%. Our expenditures are growing by almost uh, 10 to 13 million dollars. And so we have a budget gap of somewhere in the range of two to four million dollars. Um, we think we can, we will be able to close that gap by tightening, belt tightening without any major uh, reductions. Uh, but it is gonna be a year when we, uh, next fiscal year again, where it's gonna be uh, tighter than it's been uh, in the past uh, five years. Um, if you look five years now, uh, you can see that we're projecting basically a, this is a, just revenues over expenditures and you can see there's just a gap. The gap uh, is somewhere around nine to $10 million. This is above our, um, that's assuming we still have fund balance, right? So assuming that our normal structural deficit around five to $6 million, this is on top of that. And so it's just a steady um, gap that we have challenging us, that's assuming we didn't do any budget cuts or any, uh, any adjustments. So just showing if you let status quo, uh, this is also assuming no recession. This is assuming steady revenue growth of about 3% um, and steady uh, expenditure growth, which mainly is driven by uh, salary and benefit increases and some contractual increases. So this is the budget gap. Um, uh, if we, uh, you can see that in this uh, scenario, what we did is we projected that we in fact, um, how much we would have to cut out of each year to balance the budget. And so what it shows is that in 18, 19, uh, we would have to cut around uh, $4 million or um, come up with that amount of money to balance the budget. The bottom line is the, is the salary savings, the, the fund balance, and then the top line is the expenditures, the gap that we're having to close. And so you can see that it gets very big in 1920, um, goes as high, uh, high as $10 million gap there that we would have to close. And then that's assuming that every year we made those reductions that we had to, to make. And then eventually uh, it gets, we close the gap by six years from now. So um, the challenge is really gonna be uh, 1920, as you can see, that's the big challenge in here. Assuming, again, that we have normal revenue growth and that the PERS projections, and again, those are projections. PERS is not giving us firm data yet going out beyond two years. These are all projections. Uh, it just shows that we would have to do some significant cuts potentially in 1920 and 2021. And then after that, after we made those cuts, uh, we would be um, pretty much back in balance, but they're significant. They're in the $10, $10 million a year range that we'd be having, having to face. Uh, we have other initiatives that we're, um, we're doing. We're continuing to work on the budget format. We took input from the board, the public, and from staff to continue to improve it and revise it. So we will be uh, including uh, more narrative this year in explaining changes from the budget year uh, to the prior year. Uh, we're continuing to do the CIP program um, improvement of the format, and you saw that the format that was handed out hopefully was a better format that, that we had recently in this last uh, board meeting, and we will have continued uh, improvement in the uh, end of year CIP program. Uh, we will, um, are continuing our uh, major initiatives, our training programs, our strategic plan, and the big news is that next year, not this year, but next year we'll be embarking on a two-year operational plan which will also align with a two-year budget. 
And you can see that one of the big things we're gonna have to deal with is uh, potentially is, is a budget gap in the 19, 20, 20, 21 year, uh, assuming that um, our projections that we're, we just showed you are accurate. Uh, Countywide issues, uh, one issue I wanna talk to you about was cannabis growth. This is one of the big unknowns. We just don't know what to, know, to expect here, but um, this shows you what's uh, the budget in 17, 18. Uh, we basically had $3.7 million of revenue projected. That's in this current fiscal year. In 18, 19, uh, we think we're gonna be estimating growth of about $1.5 million to 5.2 million. Um, that amount is very unknown. Uh, we just don't know what's gonna happen uh, with, the, um, with the cultivators, especially the uh, dispensaries have been uh, fairly um, steady, but the uh, cultivator is, the tax there is a big unknown. It could be a lot more. Uh, we don't think it's gonna be a lot less, but it could be a lot more. So I think most of the risk is on the upside on this, so that's the good news. <laughs> I don't think there's, I think we're being conservative here, but there's a lot of unknowns in, in this area. Um, one of the issues that we continue to face is our deferred maintenance, and again, this is not a, just us, it's a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, we have a, a big need in our park facilities and our county facilities to, for just uh, doing um, maintenance on aging and obsolete equipment and buildings. Uh, and then we have some upcoming uh, issues, including, uh, in particular, there's gonna be voting systems, which are gonna be a big thing next year, and uh, we know that there's some other issues that departments will be bringing in, in the budget. Uh, we are also losing some grants uh, this uh, next fiscal year. Uh, the Sheriff Recovery Center is losing a grant. Uh, probation, uh, the Mioker grant is ending, that includes two deputy probation officers. Um, juvenile reinvestment initiative grant is also ending. So we know that a number of these uh, grants are, are ending this, this fiscal year. We're gonna have to deal with them in the next fiscal year. And of course, we wanna try and continue these programs, and so we're gonna try to absorb these, but that's gonna be another, that is another issue in terms of um, having to um, come up with new funding. So that concludes my presentation, and I don't know if you wanted to have questions for me now or wait till we have the presentations from the departments. Why don't we hear all the presentations first and then we'll ask questions, if that makes okay, sense. Great. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Leopold, members of the board. I'm Ellen Timberlake, uh, Director of the Human Services Department. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity today to address several emerging federal and state budget issues that may significantly impact our department in 1718 and beyond. So let me start at the federal level. 2017 has been a year of continuing uncertainty. As you know, Congress has made numerous attempts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Each of these has failed to secure the necessary votes in the Senate, and all of them put forth to date share in common devastating impacts on low-income individuals and families who have health care coverage, either through Cover California or the uh, Medi-Cal. With these failed attempts to repeal and replace Obamacare, it was not surprising to see the elimination of the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate included in tax bills passed in the House and Senate. Bills that are estimated to cost $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. Eliminating the individual mandate means that 13 million individuals currently abiding by the requirement to have health coverage may in fact opt out, which in turn over time destabilizes the financial structure of the insurance market. As insurance rolls decline, it is expected that premiums will rise on average an additional 10% per year. Another impact of the pending tax bill is a legal provision known as PAYGO. The statutory pay-as-you-go act was adopted in 2010 and requires that any legislation that adds to the federal deficit be paid for with spending cuts or revenue offsets. In the case of this $1.5 trillion tax bill, if Congress takes no other action, up to $150 billion per year in program eliminations and or drastic cuts will begin immediately and extend over a 10-year period. 
The list of programs impacted is over 16 pages long, but some that would impact human services directly includes uh, the elimination of the social services block grant, which is used to help fund foster care, Meals on Wheels, and other programs, as well as the elimination of our Promoting Safe and Stable Families funding, which supports critical child welfare services. In total, the provisions of the proposed tax bills will result in disproportionately negative impacts on low-income families and individuals. Unfortunately, the forecast does not improve for other critical entitlement programs that Health and Human Services rely on to serve our community. As you know, congressional leaders and the President have indicated a desire to shift their attention to entitlement reform after the final adoption of the tax bill. Three of the largest entitlement programs that they will likely look at is the Medicare program, which the federal government spends $590 billion per year on, Medicaid, which is $375 billion per year, and our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, known as CalFresh in California, which is a $70 billion per year expenditure. Should entitlement reform commence, it is anticipated that we'll also see calls for cuts to other programs, like community development block grants, Head Start, community health centers, affordable housing, just to name a few. With this sobering news, uh, let me move on to an update at the state level. Um, today I'd like to focus exclusively on an item that Carlos mentioned on the status of the in-home services uh, program. As you know, in January 2017, the governor's budget indicated that specific provisions in the legislation pertaining to the in-home support services maintenance of effort, or MOE, had been triggered and that those provisions would ultimately sunset the legislation on June 30th of 2017, effectively ending our IHSS MOE, which had been in place since 2012. By ending the IHSS MOE, substantial costs were slated to shift back to counties. Due to the enormity of the cost shifts, several work groups were formed to mitigate upcoming impacts. As a result of the advocacy efforts of CSACs and others, SB 90 and subsequently AB 130 was drafted and enacted effective July 1, 2017. The replacement bill creates a framework to mitigate the impending cost shifts of IHSS services and administration, establishes new funding mechanisms to offset the recalibrated MOE base, and adds new negotiating tools to assist counties in responding to labor requests for provider and wage benefit increases. SB 90 does not, however, address the structural funding inadequacies of the in-home support services program. While several short-term solutions have been acted, the fundamental financing structure beyond 1819 has yet to be fully addressed. This next slide summarizes the local impact of our new IHSE, IHSS MOE on our expenditures. The repeal of the IHSS MOE's MOE resulted statewide in a $600 million cost shift of IHSS expenditures to the counties. Santa Cruz County's share of this cost shift is approximately $3 million. The new MOE methodology is quite complex. It has four distinct components, services, county administration, the public authority administration cost, and our payrolling system cost. 95% of the $600 million cost shift to counties is a result of five years of increasing IHSS service cost. The primary driver of rising cost has been an increase in the number of customers enrolled in the program. In resetting the IHSS MOE for counties, two factors were used to, and weighed equally. The first was each county's percent to total of all 16, 17 expenditures, plus an inflation factor. And the second was each county's share of all the five years worth of caseload growth. For Santa Cruz County, this new adjusted IHSS MOE for 17, 18 is $9.2 million. Next year, the MOE will be adjusted by a 5% inflation factor with a 7% inflation factor for 1920. Due to the significant increase in cost shifted to the counties, negotiations between CSAC, the California Welfare Directors Association, the Department of Social Services, and the Department of Finance 
created a funding strategy to mitigate the size of these, uh, these sizable increases. The primary agents of the funding strategy were revenue offsets by the state general fund, the redirection of vehicle license fee and sales tax growth from health and mental health to the in-home support services program, and the acceleration of caseload growth payments to counties. This chart shows the projected annual county IHSX expenditures and the effect of the state general fund offsets, the redirected health and mental health VLF and sales tax growth, as well as the negotiated annual inflator. Let me walk you through local impacts just by using 1718 as an example. In 1718, the 9.2 million represents our county's new adjusted MOE. Think of it as our gross MOE cost. As you can see, it's $3 million more than the $6.2 million IHS MOE that we had in 1617. The blue shaded area represents state general funds that are being redirected to help counties pay for this new MOE. As depicted in the graph, these state general fund offsets decline over time, but it is important to note that they will remain as a permanent contribution to our MOE. The yellow or gold shaded area represents funds that are being redirected and advanced to counties to help mitigate the increased IHSS cost. In 1718, approximately 303,000 of the $1.1 million you see on the graph is redirected health and mental health funding generated from the VLF fees and sales tax growth. These funds will also be permanently added to our base However, the redirection of the VL funds are gradually phased out and slated to end in 2020-21. Of course, it goes without saying that this redirection strategy helps offset increased county costs, but the expense of our health partners who are seeing these funds uh, cut. The remaining 700,000 of the 1.1 million in the gold shaded area really just represents a change in the way the state distributes 1991 realignment funding. Prior to this change, we've received growth funding in arrears, meaning, for example, that money earned in 1516 would not be paid to us until 1718. Under the new agreement, assuming that the economy generates enough revenue, and that's an important assumption, the state will advance the county, our IHSS realignment growth, at a much faster pace. pace. They'll be advancing to us as we earn it. This leaves the brown shaded area, which represents the net county IHSS MOE obligation. In the case of 1718, 6.2 million. It should be noted, however, that this figure does not include the cost of the negotiated IHSS provider agreement approved by your board this morning. Moving forward, the net county IHSS obligation is increased by an annual inflation factor beginning with 5% in 1819 which adjust our MOE to $9.7 million, followed by 7% in 1920, which moves the MOE to $10.3 million. It is important to note that all of these cost shift mitigation strategies and accompanying funding mechanisms assumes that the sales tax revenue will be sufficient to deliver on the estimates provided by the Department of Finance. As mentioned earlier, SB 90 calls for a reopener in 2019 to really examine long-term financing solutions. This final slide reinforces that the new IHSS MOE has no impact whatsoever on the eligibility for IHSS services and how we assess the level of need. For IHSS providers, SB 90 introduces new tools for collective bargaining that help counties across the state advance wages and benefit levels by maximizing state and federal financing. We're very fortunate that the timing of these tools has allowed us to advance the wage and benefit levels of our IHSS providers as evidenced by the new three-year agreement adopted by your board this morning. Finally, we're tracking closely discussions at the state level regarding the unexpected 12% cut to our IHSS administration allocation effective this year. The good news is that a committee has formed to discuss how to incorporate uh, IHSS costs associated with mandated workload in, um, increases, and we hope that that issue may be settled in the next six or seven months. And this concludes my presentation. I'll turn it over to Director Wynn.
Well, I hope we'll hear much more happy news from uh, Director <laughs> Wynn. Oh, sorry, Jane, just a second. I was worried um, that I should probably leave now, so. Yeah, can, yeah, can happy holidays to you, uh, Director you. Timberlake. Um, <laughs> I just, just one second, technical issues. We're just trying to advance to her um, slide. It's, it's advancing, oh, I gotta do one more. This was a hyperlink, sorry, I'm, I'm famous okay. for them. Okay, got it. Good afternoon, Jane Nguyen from the Health Services Agency. Um, I wish I had better news, but um, <laughs> unfortunately we have some potential and actual impacts to our budget um, from the health side of it. We don't hold you personally responsible. Thank you, sir. Um, so I will not go into details uh, and repeat the information that uh, Director Timberlake just presented to you, um, but the five items that I'd like to present to you as potential and actual impact to the Health Services Agency budget for next year has to do with mostly federal and state um, actions. So uh, the first one, of course, we all heard about the, the threat to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act, and of course the impact would be about 35,000 individuals in Santa Cruz County um, not having coverage that they are currently having, and that we would go back to the old days prior to the ACA with uh, providing episodic care, uh, uh, less or no preventative care, uh, of course, health care costs would increase uh, because of those non-preventable uh, preventable, uh, health services. Um, we would lose significant um, uh, reimbursement funding from the feds and the state. Care coordination would be impacted. Um, and of course, um, it's, it's, it's not a good thing for Santa Cruz County here and statewide and nationwide. As we know, one of the tax, re in the, one of the tax reform proposals we heard is, has to do with the repeal of the individual mandates and that would be very devastating um, for our community because um, right now we already experience 67% in reduction of un uninsured uh, um, individuals in our community, so we need to keep up with that reduction. Uh, very good news. So, um, as you know, nothing in our budget um, at this time, too many unknowns to um, mitigate the potential impact of the ACA repeal. If that were to happen, we would have to go back to the table to renegotiate with the state because it did take $3.8 million from the county health department uh, each year uh, due to the ACA implementation. We have to work really hard with our community to look at uh, our Medicruz program again to redesign. And uh, we have to work on some, with the, uh, the Central California Alliance for Health to look at the impact on the Medi-Cal side as well for our clients. You heard about drug Medi-Cal expansion this morning. You're very aware of the potential impacts, uh, financially speaking, so I will not uh, go into details uh, on this slide because you heard about that this morning. Next item um, is um, the item that I also presented to your board last year. Um, last year, I was not very serious, uh, uh, didn't have serious concern about this, but this year I am very concerned about this. This has to do with the primary care funding cliff uh, reductions. Um, so the historical information on this was that um, prior to the Affordable Care Act, it was uh, decided by federal government that a dedicated source of funding, which is called the Community Health Center Fund, would need to be established um, to implement the Affordable Care Act because we realized that local community would be impacted with people going to primary care setting, receiving more primary care services. So federal established this community health center funds um, currently contributing about $3.6 billion per year to all local communities, uh, all health centers nationwide. So uh, in, 19, in 2015, the community health center funds um, was extended for a period of two years up until September 30th this year, 2017. And um, it has sunset it, and the federal government has not decided to renew it uh, or make a decision on it. So we are in limbo. This is about 70% reduction uh, to all local community health funds nationwide uh, that would impact uh, services to clients. Nationwide, there are about 2,800 health centers that provide health services to low-income or no-income individuals, and uh, more than 50,000 providers and staff nationwide would be displaced if we do not have this funding renewed or extended or increased. 
and 9 million patients nationwide will be impacted by this act, but non-action from Congress and from the federal government. So um, locally for our county clinics, we are looking at about $1.7 million cut that support our clinic's operation. It would impact the Santa Cruz County Community Health, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and also salute Para La Gente uh, clinics as well. This would be very devastating for the communities. So last week to avoid a federal government shutdown, um, the president signed a two-week stopgap funding measures to extend current federal government funding through December 22nd. So we are waiting to see what would happen um, after December 22nd, whether Congress and the, gov uh, and the president would approve for an extension of another uh, cycle of community health funding. Um, and also part of this was something that Supervisor Leopold mentioned this morning, the CHIP funding the children uh, insurance health plan. And it's also expired September 30th, and it's also in limbo right now. The sad part about um, the, the House version of the proposal to continue funding the CHIP program was also to take money from the public health prevention and public health funding uh, as a majority funding sources to fund CHIP. So it's Rob Peter to pay Paul. Either way, the health department and the community here will be impacted a great deal. So that is the, um, uh, something that i like to uh, inform your board about. Next thing is a cannabis business impact. And we've talked a lot about this. Your board has taken so much time uh, and effort to, to review. But from the health side, we are concerned. Uh, environmental health staff are very concerned about hazardous material handling, uh, consumer protection, water and land use concerns. Uh, we really think that um, statewide health education is important from the public health perspective to discourage inappropriate ca cannabis use, especially in the youth population. And we really want to make sure that we have, uh, we build a public health data system for decision making to constantly uh, uh, monitor uh, the impact to the public health of the community. And we want to make sure that we have adequate data and information to report to the back, uh, to the board on a periodic uh, basis. Last but not least, you heard from Director Timberlake about the uh, impact on AHSS shortfall. Um, as a result of the redirection, as you heard, the um, public health and mental health realignment grow in the 2011 realignment funding uh, would be impacted. And this, uh, for fiscal year 2018-19, we projected about $303,000 loss in our realignment growth funds that would normally support cost of livings and negotiated salary increases for employees and also for our contractor providers. So um, there are a lot more information about uh, potential impacts, but these are the major ones that we would like to inform your board. And hopefully um, some of the potential ones will not turn to, out to be reality and we can just continue to move forward. So thank you. At this time, we'll close our presentation for your board questions and consideration. All right, well, all sunshine and roses uh, uh, pre presentation. I, I, I'll just, I just want to say a couple things and then I'll let others make comments. But uh, just as a process wise, I really appreciate, Mr. Palacios, that we're having this discussion in December. I think this is the appropriate time to have it. And I appreciate your leadership in wanting to bring this information to us early to, to have us talk about these issues so we're all on the same page as, as you give direction. So I, I just want to acknowledge you and the staff for putting this together to have us address it now rather than waiting till later. I'll turn to my colleagues, uh, uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. Um, well, I agree, and thank you for bringing it in. It's so, certainly sobering uh, to see the, the challenges. Uh, and then, actually, one thing that, that wasn't mentioned here that I was just wondering about was the Prop 63 uh, shift of, from mental health to affordable housing that was discussed in the uh, legislature. I wanted to check and see if that if that's going to have a budgetary impact. Yes, I uh, think. Thank you. Um, that is the project that the state called No Place Like Home. And um, the projection was about um, $20 million hit to our county in the duration of about 10 years plus. 
And I think last year we already lost about $2 million uh, on the realignment of 2011 negotiation with other counties statewide, and we're anticipating a million dollars hit next year related to no place like home. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. I forgot about that. We did pre present that last year, but yes. Um, and then the question I had for uh, Mr. Palacios was, yeah, w when we were out visiting other counties, one of the things we saw was Marin had prepared uh, a plan in the event of a downturn in advance so that you wouldn't do sort of across the board cuts when you didn't, when you actually may need to be increasing funding for some areas and making cuts in others. Um, sort of when we're looking at this potential impact, uh, is it worth starting to think about how we can be strategic and in our decisions before we're in a crisis. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think that is one of the um, benefits of doing our strategic planning process as well, is to sort of start setting those uh, priorities for the board and the community uh, so that we're not just doing um, necessarily across the board cuts, but you're looking more strategically about um, um, perhaps cutting back in certain areas and increasing or maintaining other areas. Uh, the other thing is that I think it gives us time to also look at how to increase revenues and how to increase our, our use of our assets as well, such as the property we own in the county, uh, for example, um, such as our work practices. And so I think we know that the good thing about this is that we know that this year uh, we're balanced, next year we know will be a little bit of a challenge, but we're balanced. So we have two years, basically, to prepare for this, and so that gives us time to really start preparing and start thinking about those kind of issues. Uh, so we will definitely do that, and that's one of the things we wanted to um, do with our two-year budget, is to, that's when it'll exactly fall into when we adopting that two-year budget, is to look at how do we look at the budget strategically and try and avoid some of those uh, cuts to which areas which are priorities of the board. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. Let me echo a couple things and add a little bit of additional information. I, this is exactly why we wanted this information to come this early, and I appreciate your work, uh, Mr. Palacios, on this. And also, uh, from the community's perspective, the community understanding, this is actually, what's interesting about this is how little of this, of these impacts are actually caused by the county. Um, and I think that uh, the board in the last four or five years has worked really hard to uh, provide economic development to increase uh, housing opportunities, which also spurs economic development to improve our, the way that we do community programs and to actually have a sense of direction in how we invest, and, and the strategic plan is going to be a key component of that. Uh, all of that would be derailed by some of the, by really actually in any one of these actions actually coming to full fruition. Um, so I think it's also going to be important for us as a board and, and the county administrative office to communicate with the to continue to communicate with the community about how we actually uh, get our funds and where those responsibilities lie and some of the things that are coming down the pike. I would actually be, uh, I'm supportive of the two-year budget as you know, but I would even be interested in this year's June budget actually having scenario-based budgets uh, in advance. Something that uh, starts to give a sense of expectation for the community of what's possible should any of these uh, come to fruition and maybe even gets the board thinking in advance of how we would make a decision, including even in this budget, of increasing reserves um, in anticipation of, of, of something happening. Now, whether the PERS information isn't as bad as it's portrayed, it's still gonna be bad. Whether the federal government actually funds one of these 10 things that they're gonna cut, um, not as bad, but still bad. Uh, so I don't see anything on the horizon uh, that, that isn't going to mean, uh, even with increasing revenues associated with cannabis or economic development, that isn't going to mean we're not going to have some sort of shortfall. So it would be good, I think, if, the, if you proposed, a, normally you just propose this is what a 10 percent scenario looks like, but something a little bit more specific than that. If we experience these couple things in your department, Ms. Timberlake, this is uh, something that we may need to adopt, and we can start to create that expectation. Um, coming that time. So again, the strategic plan, this is actually for future meetings that are going to be held on the strategic plan, I think that we should also be discussing uh, this direct nexus as to uh, this is why we are creating a plan that talks about priorities, because you may not have very much funding to deal with those priorities and make sure that the community recognizes that as part of the investment. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. I'd, I'd repeat 
what was said. This is this is terrific to have it. Um, what a great Christmas present. Yeah, right. But um, the, it's it's good to know. We need to know. Um, and I I think the in-home support serv services and the retirement costs are the the biggest uh, weights that we have to um, deal with in the near future. I, I'm just want. I don't know what form we. I don't think anybody knows what this tax, federal tax reform is going to really have included in it, if indeed it happens. But um, I'd like to, as soon as it is established, say they do pass it, it would really be good to have something as soon as possible. And I don't know what, what's realistic to think about that, uh, first of March or something like that, you know, because they're gonna do it probably by the, in the next couple of weeks, 10 days. Um, when, when would be a good, a reasonable time to get an update on if <laughs> tax reform takes place. I think we're bringing, uh, planning to bring a mid-year budget, our normal mid-year budget update uh, in uh, February, in the second meeting of February, and that will be the end. But by then we'll have yeah. the mid-year results from the first half of the year, so our projections will be actual solid numbers. And at that time we could bring um, a summary of the, the federal tax reform and the potential impacts on our budget. Uh, so that would be. Yeah, and one uh, specific, and the general uh, fund five-year forecast, it, it seemed, the expenses seemed to flatten in 2018-19. Is there a reason for that or? Yeah, that's assuming that we make the big cuts that we have to and to balance the budget or we get re-increase revenues in 19-20 in, uh, and 2021. So there's two really bad years there um, that are significant budget cuts. You're talking $10 million each year. And so assuming that you, you balance the budget, either you make those cuts or you increase revenues, then the good news is that the revenues and expenditures start bring, coming back in line because the PERS costs um, flatten out then. The PERS uh, increases are actually in the next uh, three years, the biggest jumps. And so if we get past those years um, and we make we deal with it in a way that balances the budget, then the good news is that by year five year and year six, uh, you're back to a pretty close to a ba balanced budget. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I know I don't like surprises. I don't think, my, you know, <clears throat> any of us do, but it's, uh, I wanna thank you for bringing it up now so, you know, we have time to think about it, maybe even do something. Um, What's, we've hired people to fill positions, uh, which is good. Uh, what are the odds that some of those people are gonna get laid off if, uh, if we can't balance, balance this budget? Well, the, the, um, it's hard to predict uh, what would happen in, in the future. What we would do first is, is um, start um, doing some kind of sal um, hiring freeze, typically uh, is what we would start with, and we'd have to do that strategically. The, the last thing we wanna do is, is lay off people, That's, uh, you know, so we wanna be very careful about that. Uh, so um, we know that in this year and next year we have a balanced budget and we don't anticipate any layoffs. In the future it's gonna be, um, you know, there's significant budget deficits, but it's still two years in the future and we don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty still. So we, I think it's early to be talking about any um, staffing reductions at this point. Okay. Uh, can you name anything uh, that we did uh, significantly that we passed in the budget last year or maybe the year before that has actually put us in a better position than we were maybe th you know, three or four years ago? Uh, well, well, the big thing that you, this board has done is uh, establish those reserves, uh, which have got up to that 10%, and um, that may play a role in helping us to deal with these next difficult years. Uh, the reserves would be good for uh, about how, uh, for how long? Uh, uh, if we're talking about spending them, uh, that's what they are for in an emergency. Uh, but uh, how much time are we buying with that? It depends on how many positions we have to freeze maybe for hiring, but uh, um, how significant is that amount of money we have in the reserves? Is it good for one month or is it good for a year, or good for two years uh, helping us out? It, um, the reserves, um, 
could be used um, in a limited way to have a soft landing, to help you have a soft landing. Yeah. Uh, it's not gonna solve our problem by an, in and of itself, but the reserves could help us, and that's, you're right, that's why we established them. Part of, part of the reason why we established them is to help us have a soft landing in the event of a, a budget shortfall. Uh, I have done that in the past where I've used reserves strategically over a five-year period and you draw down a few million every year to help reduce some of the cuts. Uh, but you can only do that if you see on the other end that you're gonna get increased revenues or that reductions are gonna be taking place to balance your budget. So they definitely will be part of the solution and that's why we established them and that's when we definitely want to use them strategically but it's, you have to be very careful also because they're one-time money, right? That the reserves are by definition one-time money and so you still have to structurally get your budget back in balance. Okay, and then uh, looking at uh, future obligations for uh, retirement, uh, uh, if we have people living longer, we actually could have, what, three people getting paid for the same job. We'd have one that retired and then another one that retired and then currently paying somebody to fill the position. Uh, I mean, if we, we haven't seen that before, but I, what I'm getting at is we are trying to look at it like a life insurance salesman. They have everything projected, right? So, I mean, how, uh, how are we gonna work around that? What, are we, what can we do now to help us out in the future? Are we gonna have to have different contracts for newer, new employees? Are we gonna try to uh, change contracts that people currently have? Are we gonna, you know, these are all ifs. Well, the good news is that you, uh, you have done something already in the past when you, uh, you did adopt a second tier and that saved the county billions of dollars literally right. over the time. And so uh, that second tier is very important. And then the governor and the legislature and, um, uh, adopted uh, the Public Employee Pension Reform Act uh, of 2013, which means that new employees, employees coming into the system are at a different rate that's uh, much less uh, expensive. And so those two acts over time are going to balance the system. The problem is getting uh, from today until you know six years from now when those uh, new employees become the majority of the employees. So th we have some, there are already solutions in place, uh, but it's gonna be, uh, the problem is getting from here when you have current employees who are in the old uh, retirement systems until you get to the point where the majority of people are on the new retirement systems. And that's where we get at uh, two, two percent at 55 or, for a while there was 50, right? Well, okay, so the miscellaneous formula is two, was 2% two at 55, so 2% of salary at 55 years of age, and then it went, you adopted a second tier, which was two at 60, so 2% right. uh, at the age of 60. Uh, that's what this board adopted, and then the State um, Pension Reform Act is two at 67. So 2% at 67. And for public safety, it's at, um, it was at 3% at 50, and it's, and the Public Prevention Act, it's 2.7 at 57. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, and uh, every little bit helps. Uh, I know it's rougher on the people, you know, that are getting higher now and all that. What about the current employees, like all of us? Uh, how are we gonna be affected? Uh, we, we, we were under uh, an old contract. Uh, any changes to our contract maybe going forward? There's, um, there is a court case um, before the Supreme Court that was brought forward by uh, some cities, I believe it was San Diego, San Jose, that basically those cities tried to change retirement formulas of current employees going forward. So not your, what you've earned in the past, what, you've, what you're gonna earn in the f going forward. Currently, the new pension formulas only apply to new employees brand new to the system. What San Jose and San Diego tried to do is change formulas for current employees going forward from a date certain. Um, th that's in the court system right now. I think um, that'll probably be decided within the next year. And then I think that um, will be, you know, could have ramifications across the state in terms of changing that, uh, those formulas for current employees. But right now it's still in the courts and there's still a lot of uncertainty about that, so it's still a big unknown. 
Yeah, I just want to lastly say thank you again uh, for the information, and I think it helps us, uh, you know, get ready for the future budgets that we have to work on. And I know with the health services, your funding is more federal state, right? And uh, so I don't know, in your opinion, do you think that's more critical than our local uh, uh, funding source? And I have one last thing after that, and that would be property tax. Yes, for the health services agency, um, about 8% of our budget, annual budget is net county cost, county general funds. The rest is federal and state, like you said. And most of what we get from federal and state are actual services that are provided either by our own county employees or by contract providers. And so it's reimbursement basis. So as long as we provide services, we claim uh, we receive funding accordingly. So some of the federal action that we are talking about today are potential impact uh, related to um, grants uh, from the federal for certain areas such as the county clinics. And, and those are categorical grants. They're not actual reimbursement of services, so they're two different sources of federal fundings. One is actual services provided, and we get reimbursement for those services, and, one's, and the other one is categorical grant funding. <coughs> so the, the potential impact that we talked about today with federal has to do with the grant funding, categorical grant funding for, for community centers. Sure. And then uh, property taxes, I know with the deduction, uh, maybe not being able to use more than $10,000 <coughs> as a deduction on your uh, uh, IRS uh, reporting. Uh, they say that that's going to make, uh, what, the price of homes come down a little bit. People won't be able to afford uh, staying in the homes they're buying. <coughs> so uh, that, that all affects us also. I don't know if that's a $10,000 deduction per house that maybe somebody uh, owns two houses. Is that 10,000 each or is it 10,000 on one only or a combination of all of them? I don't know. So, I don't think any of us know at this point. Thank you. If I may, there's one other item. The, if the federal government decided to change the structure and the funding structure of Medicaid program, that would greatly impact um, state and local ability to receive federal reimbursement for actual <coughs> services as well. So that's still in the talk at the federal level, and we're not sure what they're going to decide. So it would become a block grant type sure. of situation versus fee-for-service or actual capitated model. And federally, you're, you're facing a, a very unclear picture right now. Yes. Thank you. You know, um, the, the, over my term on the board, uh, I've been here during uh, really bad times um, and, and slightly better times. And the board has taken lots of actions um, to, to sort of right the ship uh, in a lot of ways here. I mean, it, it was discussed uh, about the, the funding of the programs we have, whether that be uh, economic development, um, talked about the, the, the pension changes that we made, um, that we did in, in collaboration with our employees, that, um, um, and we built up a reserve to be able to weather storms, not, not make them go away. Uh, but as you um, remarked, a softer landing. Um, and we got the good news recently that uh, we are, our, our credit rating was raised because of those measures. Um, but the storm that is, uh, that is the federal government and what's happening in Washington is extraordinary. Um, programs that have historically had bipartisan support, the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, the community health clinics funding, those were bipartisan supported um, uh, legislation and we're supposed to care about the next generation and we, we hear uh, uh, members of Congress talking about what we're going to leave for our kids all the time. The CHIP funding ran out on September 30th. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't hear, I don't hear anything that that's going to be included before the end of the year. Um, the, the best I heard is that they're gonna, they might try to provide some stopgap funding for those states that are going to run out of money um, before the end of the year. But if, um, if the past is any prologue to the future, don't count on it. Um, it's, it's really uh, pretty scary. And when we think <laughs> watching the um, 
the surreal nature of a healthcare discussion that was about taking away healthcare from people under the guise that they said they would make it better um, was surreal enough. But a tax uh, cut discussion where uh, all the Denzians of the uh, uh, fiscal conservatives were, were admitting that no matter what they did, whatever, whatever their details are, that it was gonna blow a $1.5 trillion hole into our budget is surreal. Um, and when you look at what choices uh, members of Congress were making, it's, it's even more extraordinary because it was to give corporations whose effective tax rate is way lower than, than the listed tax rate and wealthy people. And, in, and on top of it, inherited wealth got the, be best, um, uh, the best deal out of the whole uh, um, effort. Um, and that the, most of us are gonna see our taxes go up in a couple years. Um, and uh, and now they, they haven't even waited for that tax cut bill to, to, to pass. Uh, they're already talking about cutting the programs that they claim that they were never gonna cut. And I, the, the biggest issue I take with your presentation is when you call it entitlement reform, you're buying in to the language that is, uh, is, is not accurate. It is not entitlement reform. It is slashing the safety net. That is what this is about. That has been a lifelong goal of many of these Republicans. Uh, Paul Ryan in college bragged about his Rand-like uh, um, uh, fidelity uh, to this, uh, that kind of craziness. We should not buy into their language and call it what it is, which is slashing the safety net. Um, and, and whether it be through PAYGO or just their maniacal drive to, to, to try to do everything they can because Hopefully there's gonna be a reckoning in 2018, in November 2018. <clears throat> we can expect the next year to be worse, not better than, than um, this. And so uh, uh, there are a couple questions that I, uh, I had. One is one of the elements of this tax cut bill was uh, the SALT uh, deductions, right? The state and local tax deductions, which uh, disproportionately affect states like ours. Um, when we think about future revenue uh, pieces, uh, Mr. Palacios, what do you think the effect of these of these salt deducting changes would have on our ability to even raise funds? Well, the um, loss of the salt deductions hits states like California disproportionately because we have an income tax, uh, relatively high income tax, and property tax. And so what that means is that either it'll be severely limited or cut back. Uh, which means that uh, many Californians will see their taxes go up and there will be a reaction, I believe, in that you will no longer be able to deduct uh, your property tax or your income tax from your, uh, your state income tax from your federal income tax. So what I think that does is that when you go for a revenue measure, for example, to um, the local school district goes for a revenue measure to uh, put a bond on the property tax, people are gonna be less likely to support it, I believe because their tax bill will have gone up in, in their federal uh, tax bill because they will no longer be deductible. And so I think there's gonna be pressure to not increase um, property taxes in any way, and there may be even pressure to reduce them. So it's a, it's a very uh, significant thing to a state like New York or California uh, where there's gonna be significant pressure um, placed on, on us because of folks having struggling um, to have to pay their new federal tax bills. Um, the other question I have is, uh, I, I've been supportive of the two-year uh, budget idea, and what my colleague mentioned about scenarios may be a good w way to th start thinking about this year. Um, given what we see on the horizon, does a two-year budget limit our flexibility to be able to respond? And I wanted you to, to be able to address that because I think that's an important part. As we look at these uh, rocky, uh, you know, waters over the uh, over the next couple of years, will the two-year budget cycle help or hurt us? Yeah, I think it uh, it will help you in terms of your long-term planning, and I don't do not think it limits your flexibility. Uh, you by law you cannot adopt uh, legally a second year of the budget. You're really adopting that first year. Uh, legally, you can only adopt one one year at a time. Uh, 
So the second year of a budget, of a two year budget is really just a very detailed planning document. And what you do is you come back that second year and you amend that first year budget and then you have to legally adopt it. Um, most years, hopefully that second year is a much, uh, it's just fine tuning, right? You've already have a detailed plan in place. Uh, you don't have to have as extensive budget hearings. Uh, you can just basically fine tune the budget and adopt that second year. However, if there are major changes, uh, you can always have a, a more extensive budget process should the circumstances require it. Um. Uh, let's just talk about revenue for a, a moment. Um, you mentioned, you pointed out that there was a $10 million uh, need in our park system and $35 million for our county uh, facilities. Um, there's going to be a state parks bond on the ballot. Do we think that that will uh, provide resources that would help um, uh, address some of that $10 million parks um, um, deficit? Uh, we do. Um, our parks director um, has commented, though, that he believes the details of how that money would be given out have not come out, but typically the state requires a match, and um, often a significant match, 50% match. And so the issue for us is to be eligible for those state funds is more than likely we're going to have to come up with a local match. So that's going to be the challenge that we're going to be faced with. I appreciate that. The other area you talked about was the cannabis, and it, it's a great unknown in terms of what, what that will mean. Have we gotten any estimates about what we m might be able to generate? I know you have you've gave uh, some numbers, and I recognize that they're <sighs> that they're that, that they're estimates because we're in a we're in a new world there. But do we have a range that uh, any of our experts have talked about? In our uh, in the slide we showed you, uh, we are projecting in um, the current year to have about 3.7 million, and next fiscal year, 2018-19, about five million dollars of revenue. Yeah. When we uh, talked to uh, HDL, uh, when we were working um, on the scenarios for the tax rates, uh, they did some uh, sort of very rough modeling, and they thought that it's theoretically possible that we could have as much as $10 million of revenue once the industry gets built out, right? And so we're projecting $5 million, 18, 19. So they're projecting that could be almost double, 10 million, once the industry gets established and built out. But a lot of uncertainty there. Yep. But certainly uh, within the realm of possibility. What well, is a, a, a potential ray of hope? Because I don't know where we get five or $10 million easily. Um, and uh, if HDL is, has, uh, if they're accurate, um, or if they're even close to accurate, uh, that could that could be a, a real life preserver for um, uh, the county budget. Uh, so it's something to think about in the future. Uh, I'll uh, open it up to members of the public if anybody wants to address us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wow, my head's spinning. <laughs> My name is Becky Steinbrunner, and thank you for this report. I remember, I think it was year before last, <clears throat> bad news like this did come at a surprise, and and that's when I remember first hearing that the county was operating a $12.8 million deficit. And so I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, at budget time last June, I heard it was reduced to 7.2 or 4 or something, but there was still that lag. Um, so I'm, I'm a little confused when I hear that it's a balanced budget. Um, I'd like some clarification on that. Um, I wonder about the um, issue of, I hear the, the board and staff hiring outside consultants a lot for public works projects. I mean, we, we've, we've hired on um, 15 to 25 million dollars worth of engineering outside of county um, facilitators to help um, with various development projects. Um, selecting you, Mr. Palacio, was $35,000 outside. I hear this a lot, not only in the county, but also in the water districts, and that's got to be expensive. And I wonder if Part of the belt tightening could not be that more work is done in-house. And I wonder if those, I would like 
to know if those consultants are part of the 49% um, pie of salary that is the county's expense. Um, my daughter works as a paramedic in the adjacent county and she's telling me she's already seeing the effects of the uh, ACA and how people call 911 to get a ride to the ambulance to the hospital because they cannot be refused care if they go in that way. And I expect uh, we, we're gonna see a lot of that and we'll put a huge strain also on our emergency response. Um, the PERS issue is huge and you are not alone in that. Aptos La Selva Fire is also looking at balloon um, things as is SoCal Creek Water. So this is like a tidal wave coming our way and I'm worried and I really want to thank you Mr. Palacio and also staff here for um, sounding the warning of the approaching tidal wave so that um, our supervisors can take good leadership and do what they can. Um, I urge you in all future meetings to take a look at really the necessity of um, some of the expenses that are being brought to you with the idea that we do need to tighten our belts now. Thank, Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jim Coffus from Ben Lomond, and uh, I want to speak uh, briefly on behalf of the uh, Green Trade uh, Santa Cruz, the Coalition of Cannabis Businesses, and suggest that, um, uh, or thank you for uh, opening the door so that uh, many of our businesses can uh, approach the state for a temporary license beginning as soon as possible. That's uh, something that we asked you about in May and um, this past week, uh, the word went out to uh, cultivators and manufacturers to uh, come in and submit their applications to see if they were eligible. So I think as you get more of those uh, businesses uh, through the system and into the uh, uh, regulated market, uh, the faster you will see an increase in revenues. I think you get two and a, two and a half million dollars on retail alone right now, you should be looking at uh, multiples of that in, from cannabis and uh, from cultivation and manufacturing, assuming those businesses are able to operate. So I would hope that you'd continue to uh, help them uh, maybe even so far as to encourage them to uh, get involved and uh, make it uh, more welcoming for them to participate in the regulated uh, industry so they can contribute. One other thing, the, uh, there is going to be a windfall uh, at the state level for taxation. There is no doubt whatsoever by any expert that the uh, state tax uh, revenue is going to see a significant increase. A lot of that money that the state will be taking in ought to be coming back to local uh, jurisdictions that have participated with the state in this uh, regulated economy. So it will be very important for us to uh, be speaking uh, to our legislators and to our uh, uh, lobbyists in Sacramento to make sure that Santa Cruz gets the uh, uh, share that they deserve of the uh, tax fall, windfall that the state is gonna get. So look into that. Uh, I do believe that the cannabis revenue uh, can be a sustainable uh, tax revenue for the county for a long time if we uh, foster and encourage its growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chief Chastain. I'm from Coralitas. And uh, we all look forward to more revenues from the green rush that we're having. But I, I spoke once on this about getting a proper um, survey registered with the county. Because a lot of these young kids are buying the property and they're encroaching on their neighbors. And I've just ch checked with Robin, there's no regulations written into it, into the regulations for the cannabis about having proper surveys of where your property line stands. And up in the rural areas, up in Upper Corlitas, it's a problem of encroachment. It's a problem of encroachment on the parks, 
the, and the private property owners. So I'd really like to, I spoke to Mr. Friend and, and John Leopold on this issue, and I'd like to see it addressed. I've talked to the county about, they don't have proper monuments, it's never been properly surveyed. And so they say, well, it's on you to prove it. I've lived up there 25 years, and this is now becoming a problem. And so I'd like to see that uh, in, the, in the regulations for the cannabis growing, is to have proper certified uh, surveys, registered surveys, on each growing, it, maybe just in the rural areas, maybe that might help. But it's beginning to be a problem and it's gonna get bigger, so I'd like to see that addressed. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else, uh, uh, we do have uh, a limited uh, set of actions here. Uh, does anybody want to make a motion or any additional comments? Move the recommended action. Motion by friend, I mean motion by Coonerty, seconded by friend. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, that ends uh, today's, uh, oh right, we do have one more item, 64.1 which was item 11, thank you for the presentation. Item 11 was accept and file progress report on development of a drop-in day center for the homeless as recommended by the county administrative officer. Uh, Ms. Steinbrenner, you pulled this item. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I pulled it because when I was reading through the documentation, what caught my eye is that um, staff is considering uh, declaring a local state of emergency or shelter crisis to expedite siting of the day, uh, homeless day drop-in center that would allow for amendment to zoning, building and other building codes, regulatory codes, reduce land use barriers, which I interpret as public input, CEQA process, and expedite contracting processes. It, it also has the intent to raise public awareness and um, to expedite uh, staff abilities to take quicker action. Um, there are four places can, uh, currently that I guess staff has identified for this center. They're all over in the Harvey West area. Um, and so staff is looking at vacant commercial industrial sites to lease. So my I have questions and I did write you, but I didn't get an answer. So that's part of why I needed to pull it off today. But I also think this could be a very serious thing for our community to declare a local state of emergency. How, um, so my questions are these. What is the process for declaring a local state of emergency or shelter crisis? What are the impacts of doing this on the public process, the public's involvement in the process and the um, commercial surrounding um, commercial interest involvement in the process. How would doing this take a, t this action affect the local economy? We are a tourist economy. While declaring a state of housing emergency may um, raise awareness, awareness for the locals, I think we're all very aware. But what will it do to the image of Santa Cruz County for those who come here to vacation? And how will it affect the environment if there are uh, building codes, environmental barriers, things like that that would be waived? How will that affect the environment? And I want that to know that the county is thoroughly, especially given what we've just heard, thoroughly considering using county-owned facilities and not leasing. And I'm also curious why it's all being centered in one place in Harvey West. How was that place selected? Why is there nothing in Watsonville or the South County area? And um, I just have a lot of concerns about this, not only the process, but the long-term implica implications. And Thank I think you. we do want to address the homeless but I think we have to do this carefully and be responsible to those who are working very hard. Can I, yeah, w Supervisor Coonerty. Can I recommend that uh, 
Becky, speak with staff. A lot of those questions were answered or would be answered when and if any jurisdiction took up these questions. Those are all the questions that would be brought up. So there's answering them now seems premature. There is definitely uh, information uh, um, uh, in the the board letter about the, the South County Day uh, Center, and you know, so the idea that we're only doing it in one area is not accurate. Um, <clears throat> and why don't you briefly just say uh, the consideration of a, an emergency? What what would you do if you wanted to have us consider that? Good afternoon, and thank you, board. Um, as the letter says, we're actually exploring what the implications would be and what the process would be. We're investigating what have other communities done, why did they do it, what were the results of that, and um, you know what were the advantages or disadvantages to doing that. So many of the questions Ms. Steinbrunner has raised would be, of course, considered. Um, we are not making any decisions or recommendations at this time. We just wanted you to be aware that we are looking at it as a possibility. Um, there are numerous communities, particularly on the West Coast, that have explored doing this, and many that have done it. And you know, I cited some of the reasons why they do it, um, not that we're necessarily seeking to do it for that, <clears throat> you know, for all those same reasons. Um, and yes, we are definitely pursuing a day center and emergency shelter in Watsonville, and that's actually much further along than our plans here in North County. Thank okay, you. and do you want to identify yourself for oh, people I'm know? Oh, I'm sorry, who? Rainey Marr, uh, County's Homeless Services Coordinator. Uh, and uh, for Ms. Steinbrenner, she's an excellent person to talk to if you have uh, questions about that. Um, I'll see if the board has any other questions or will be willing to take action. I will move the recommended action. Motion by Coonerty, seconded by Friend. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, motion carries unanimously. And with that, we end the, um, uh, the last meeting of 2017. We will be having a closed session. Is there anything reportable out of that closed session? No, there is not. So to those watching at home, thank you for uh, watching today's meeting. Thank you to Community TV. Our next board meeting will be January 9th uh, here in the board chamber starting at 9 o'clock. I look forward to seeing you then.